Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you husky! Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Hear those jet planes? Now you see them. Now you don't. Yes, when you pour out a bowl full of swell-tasting Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice for breakfast, add milk or cream and your favorite fruit, now you see them, now you don't. So crisp, so tender, so tempting, they disappear in a flash. Mmm, no, you just can't beat these giant king-sized kernels of premium wheat or rice shot from guns. They're the one and only Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice that come in the big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Gary Evans was a trapper who had settled a short distance from Selkirk. He had brought his wife Lucy from Seattle during the first gold rush, hoping to make a strike. But his claim gave out, and he turned to trapping as a means of making a living during that first winter. He soon found that furs were secondary only to gold in value, and decided to continue what he had started. One afternoon, Gary sat at a table in the cafe talking to one of his friends. Yes, sir, you ought to take a tip from me and give up prospecting. I've done well at trapping, and I made a good deal to sell my furs. Well, I'm glad to hear it, Gary. Do you have enough furs to make it worth your while to stick at it? Look, believe it or not, I'll get enough from these furs to see us through all next winter. Say, that is something. But when do you get your money? The deal will be completed tomorrow. I didn't realize there was so much money to be made in trapping. Did you bring your furs with you into town? I'd like to get a look at them, Gary. No, I didn't bring them in yet, not till tomorrow. I have them stored in the shed in back of our cabin. I'm telling you, Ed, Lucy will be tickled pink when she hears what I'm going to get for those furs. Well, how did you come to meet the fellow who's going to buy them? Well, I, I just wrote to the Royal Northwest Mounted Police Headquarters in Dawson City, asking them how to get cash for my furs. They turned my letter over to an agent for a fur company up there. He sent me word he'd be in town today, so I came down and met him. He looked over the furs I had this morning. Then we came back to town, and after a lot of figuring, he made me the offer. Well, maybe we all better start trapping. Yeah, looks like he's doing better than us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm plenty satisfied anyway. Well, now I better go on out and tell Lucy about our good luck. I'll see you all later. So long, Gary. We'll see you. It was late afternoon when Gary Evans arrived at his cabin. He entered with a light step and with a big smile on his face. Lucy! Yes, Gary? Well, honey, I made a fine deal for our furs. Oh, Gary, I'm so glad. I'm to deliver them in town tomorrow and collect. <laughs> we can face the coming winter with, with plenty in the bank to see us through. I hope from now on our worries will be over, Gary. They will be. I'll let the others hunt for gold. I'll stick to trapping and, and end up with more in the long run. <laughs> Say, you know, honey, we ought to go into Selkirk tonight and celebrate a little. What do you say to that? I'd like it. We could go see that show in town. All right, that's what we'll do. Let's have a quick supper, then we'll get started for town. Gary and Lucy Evans arrived in town, and leaving their horses at the livery stable, they walked past the cafe toward the crude theater a few doors away. A man lounging on the cafe veranda watched them as they entered the theater. Then he turned and went into the cafe. Yeah, yeah. 
He walked to the back of the cafe and stopped at a table where a tough-looking friend of his sat playing solitaire. Yeah, hi, Joe. I thought I'd find you here. Sit down and take a load off your feet, Alex. Yeah. Thanks. What's on your mind? I just had an idea, Joe. We both need money, and I know how we can get it. Yeah? What's the idea you got? Remember that young trapper, Gary Evans, who came in here this afternoon talking about the deal he made for his furs? Mm-hmm. What about him? I just saw him and his wife going into the opera house down the street. Oh. They won't be out for a couple of hours. Go on. Well, those furs of his are still out at his place. He's supposed to bring him in tomorrow to close the deal he made. We'd have plenty of time to go out there and grab those furs. Then we could head for White Horse and sell them. We could use our two pack horses to tote the furs from his place to White Horse. Hey, looks like you've come up with a good idea, Alex. Let's go get our horses. By the time they get home, we can be well along on a trail south. I know somebody in the White Horse would be glad to buy them. Come on, let's go. About half an hour after going into the theater, Gary and Lucy Evans came out and walked toward the livery stable. Gary, I'm awfully sorry about getting a headache and spoiling your evening. I guess I'm just not used to crowds anymore. Oh, that's all right, honey. The show wasn't too good anyway. Knowing that at last we'll have several thousand dollars to see us through has been enough excitement for one evening. <laughs> we'll celebrate some other time, dear. Yeah, just forget about it. We'll head for home. A good night's rest is what you need. And I can get an early start to town in the morning. A short time later, Gary and Lucy approached their cabin. The twilight of the Yukon summer night was bright enough for them to see clearly. It was Lucy who suddenly spoke. Gary, look. I see horses near the shed where our furs are stored. Holy mackerel, you're right. Someone must be after those furs. Get up there. Gary, wait. You don't have a gun. Cutting across from the trail, Gary headed toward the rear of the cabin. His one thought was to protect his valuable store of furs. As he rode near the shed, he yelled out, Hey, get away from there! Get away from that shed! No! Get out of here! Get up, get up, boy! Come on! Gary! Gary! Oh! Oh, there's Eddie! Eddie! Oh, Gary! Gary! Hi. I'm all right. Oh. A bullet nicked my arm. The force stunned me for a minute. I'll get you into the cabin and fix the wound. No, I, I have to see about the furs. Come on. Leaving their horses, Gary and Lucy approached the door to the shed. The lock had been forced and the door hung open. Gary, the furs, they're gone. That dirty crooks. I'll get my gun and follow them until I... Oh, oh, oh. My, my arm. No, no, Gary. Your arm has to be attended to right away. Now, let's go into the cabin. After I fix your arm, you can rest while I ride to town for the constable. And I'll get the doctor, too. No, I, I'll be all right. No, that wound is worse than you think. Now, come on. Taking Gary to the cabin, Lucy bound his wound. The loss of blood made Gary feel weak, and he finally had to lie down in spite of his determination to follow the men who had stolen his furs. Leaving Gary on his cot, Lucy mounted her horse and headed for Selkirk. Get up there! Get up! Meantime, the two crooks, Alex and Joe, rode along the south trail, leading the two fur-laden pack horses. Thought you said Evans went to the show in town. They did. I saw him go in. Well, something must have happened to make him suspicious. I didn't figure on having to put a bullet in him. If he get caught now, it'll mean a murder charge, maybe. You fool, you should have shot over his head. They're liable to be after us now. Yeah, maybe we better go back. Make sure that woman doesn't leave for town. No, that'll take time. She may have gone for the Mounties already. You can't go into White Horse now with those furs. They'll telegraph ahead and be on the lookout. We'll have to change our plans. I know of a cave near here where we can hide the furs. Then we'll hightail it back to Selkirk and throw off suspicion by being seen at the cafe tonight. Hey, that's a good idea. Lead the way to that cave. Then we'll get back to town as fast as we can. Come on, let's get a move on. Get, get up, there. Come on. Later that night, Lucy Evans arrived at the constable's office and reported the robbery. Then, with the constable and the doctor, she returned to the cabin where her husband was waiting. Two hours later, the constable, after trying to trail the crooks, returned to Selkirk and went to his office, where he found Sergeant Preston and his dog, King, waiting. Hello, Hal. Sergeant. We found the door unlocked, so we made ourselves at home. Light was still burning, so I figured you'd be back before long. Sergeant, I'm glad you came in tonight. Why, something happened? Yes, Gary Evans, a trapper living a few miles south of here, had his fur stolen. He and his wife arrived at the cabin in time to see the crooks about to leave. Gary was shot in the arm, and they got away with the furs. I see. I know Gary and Lucy Evans. 
you pick up the trail of the crooks? Yes, I did. They followed the south trail a short distance, then turned off toward the foothills. I lost the trail, though, when they covered up by riding in the creek a few miles out. Mm. Somebody must have heard about the furs when Gary came to town and made a deal to sell them today. He was to deliver them in the morning. Oh, that's too bad. I'll telegraph to Whitehorse in case they go there. Then King and I'll try to pick up the trail where you left off. Fine. I was hoping you'd help. Oh, but we'll have to find the telegraph operator. The office is closed by now. I know him by sight. I'll go to the cafe and see if he's there while you go to his cabin. Right. I'll meet you later at the telegraph office, and then we'll go out to pick up the trail. Let's go, King. (laughs) Meanwhile, Alex and Joe had arrived at the cafe after hiding the furs and circling back to town. They were seated at a rear table in the cafe when Sergeant Preston and King entered. Hey, look, Joe. It's that Monty Preston with that dog of his. Holy smoke, I didn't count on him being in town. It's that dog I'm worried about. He can pick up a trail that the Mounties themselves can't follow. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Preston's talking to the barkeep. I'm looking for the telegraph operators. Have they been in here recently? Nope. Not tonight, Sergeant. Guess you'll find him in his cabin. Oh, thanks. You should come in within the next ten minutes or so. Tell him to come to the telegraph office, will you? It's very important. All right. If he comes in, I'll tell him. Something happened, Sergeant? Yes, a fur robbery. I'll bet if that dog of yours gets in the trail, he'll catch the crooks. I hope so. I think he'll have a chance to try anyway. We'll be going out to take up the trail. Oh, uh, be sure to send the telegraph operator to his office if he comes in here. Good night. Come on, Gary. Good night, Sergeant. We've got to get out of here, Alex. What are we going to do? That monkey gets out there with that dog. They'll find the furs and follow our trail back to town. we got to clear out a cell curtain quick. Oh, wait. i got a better idea. If we can get out on the trail before pressing that dog head that way, maybe we can stop him. Hey, maybe that is the answer. We'll wait along the trail and ambush him. The only thing that'll save our necks now is to get rid of both Sergeant Preston and that dog. Let's go. We'll continue our story in just a moment. there, partner. What goes on here? Yeah, hey, I'm a rootin' tootin' cowhand, that's what. Well, so I see. You look like one, too. Judging from that ten-gallon hat, chaps, boots, spurs and all. But look, mister, just you put up those shooting irons of yours and calm down. Fell ought to know better than to go around waving a pair of six-shooters. Partner, you're right. Dead right. But say, these are just pea-shooters. For real excitement, let me tell you about the kind of gun that gives me a bigger kick than a Longhorn Texas steel. Oh? Mister, I'm talking about a gun that's got them all beat. Partner, that's the gun that shoots Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Oh, you're telling me. Yes, sir. Fella with any zip and go to him needs to stow away a He-Man breakfast. Now you're talking, and Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat fills the bill for you, huh? Does it ever. Just pour on the old milk or cream... Add your favorite fruit, and you know what? What? There's no beating this eating. That's what. (laughs) Well, sir, fellas and girls, that's a mighty good tip. So tomorrow morning, be sure to get the drop on a really swell-tasting breakfast. Eat Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. The ready-to-serve breakfast cereal shot from gun. Yes, Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat are shot from gun actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender, bigger and better tasting. Important, too, wheat or rice shot from guns is good for you. Both delicious kinds furnish extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Man, oh man, don't miss out another day. Say to mom, from now on I want to eat Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Now to continue our story. After leaving the cafe, Alex and Joe hurriedly mounted and rode from town along the south trail. Meantime, the constable had found the telegraph operator, and after sending a wire to Whitehorse, the two Mounties left the telegraph office and stood at the hitch rack outside talking. Now we can take King with us and go out to Evans' place to pick up the trail of those crooks, eh? No, Al. King and I'll go. 
You stay here and inquire around town. See if you can find out who was seen leaving Selkirk during the early part of the evening. All right, Sergeant. I guess that is the best idea. But when you and King catch up with him, you may need help. Well, King's a lot of help in cases like that. The trail might lead all the way to Whitehorse, and you'll be needed here. Yes, I guess you're right. Well, good luck. If I get a line on her identity, I'll send a wire to Whitehorse with her description. Good. Steady, Blanky. We'll get started now. Come on, King. Good night, Sergeant. So long, Hal. Get up, Blanky. Alex and Joe rode a short way out the south trail, then turned onto a branch trail that gradually became separated from the main trail by a narrow rocky gorge, yet ran parallel to the trail which Sergeant Preston would take. About a quarter of a mile from the Evans cabin, they reined to a halt. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Oh, oh, steady, boy. Oh. Yeah, there's some bushes along the edge of that gorge there that separates us from the main trail. Yet it's only about a hundred feet across. We can hide there and wait. It's a good idea. We can get a sure shot at that mountain in the dark. And if we miss, they can't get across to get us. Yep, that's the idea. Now let's get over there and get ourselves settled. So as when they do come along, we'll be all ready to give them lead. It was almost half an hour later when Sergeant Preston and King approached the place opposite where the two killers were waiting an ambush across the gorge. The wind was blowing from the trail toward the hiding men so that King didn't get their scent and had no warning that they were there. We'll soon reach the Evans cabin, King, and you can pick up the trail. Easy, boy. We may have a long way to go before we catch up to them. Easy, Blackie. Get around now. In another moment, the Mountie and his dog were just about opposite the place where Alex and Joe were waiting with guns ready. Then, two shots rang out. From across the narrow gorge, Alex and Joe saw the Mountie fall from his horse. Yeah, my bullet got Preston. He fell off his horse. He's hidden by the growth along the edge of the gorge over there. Yeah, but I missed that doggone mutt. Now I can't see him. He ran back to where Preston is. Now let's wait a few minutes. We might get another chance at that dog. Oh, no, we better move on. Someone might have heard the shots. Look, we got the Mountie. That's enough. Without him, that dog won't be much good. All right. When the excitement dies down in a few days, we'll go get those furs and find some place to get rid of them. Now, let's go. All right. He's good. There, steady, boy. Get up. Get up. For a few minutes, the great dog King sniffed and whined at his master's side as Preston lay still on the trail. The shots had been sudden, and King was at a disadvantage since no scent came his way. In a few minutes, after the two crooks had left on the other side of the gorge, Mm. Sergeant Preston stirred. Then, putting his head to his temple, he sat up. Oh, my shoulder. It's all right, fella. It's all right. That bullet nicked my shoulder and knocked me out of the saddle. Must have dazed me a minute. My head hit the hard ground. We'll get to the Evans cabin, boy. I'll have to rest a bit. Then we'll get the ones who did this. I'm sure when we do, we'll have the crooks who took Evans furs. Let's go, fella. Within a short time, Sergeant Preston and King reached the Evans cabin and knocked at the door. Yes, what can... Sergeant Preston and King. We were shot at on the trail. Oh, you're hurt. Sergeant, do come in. The bullet barely grazed my shoulder. Knocked me off my horse. Oh, do sit down. I'll get some water and a bandage. Gary's over there on the car. Oh, hello, Gary. Hello, Sergeant Preston. I didn't know you were in town. I arrived there a short time ago. Constable told me what happened out here, so I was coming out with King to trail the men who stole your furs. What? They must have known you were coming out. I tried to ambush you. Yes, I'm sure the shots came from across the gorge and the way King acted. No way for him to get over there after them. How's your arm? Oh, it's all right. Have to wear a sling for a while, though. Here's the water, Sergeant. I'll fix your shoulder. Oh, thanks. It's just a scrape. Oh, you're very fortunate. Yes, I know. You'd better rest here until morning. Well, thanks, Lucy. At dawn, King and I'll get over on the other side of the gorge and trail whoever shot at us. After leaving the place from which they had shot at Sergeant Preston and King, Alex and Joe rode for a time in silence. Then Alex spoke. Joe, uh, I've been thinking. What about? I think we're making a mistake going back into Selkirk. If somebody finds Preston's body on the trail, the constable might learn we were out of town at the time he was killed. Well, then what do you want to do? I'll rein in for a minute. Ho, ho, oh, ho. I think it'd be wiser to go up to the cave where we left the furs. The pack horses are still waiting there, you know. And anyway, we didn't leave them much feed. You mean we should hide out there? Look, we don't have any supplies. No, we don't have to stay there. 
With Preston out of the way, we can hit the trail, taking the furs with us. We don't dare ride into White Horse with the furs. Don't forget they sent a telegram about the robbery. Yeah, I know, I know. But a friend of mine has a cabin a short distance from White Horse. We can hide the furs there until the whole thing blows over and then sell them. He knows just how to get rid of them without suspicion. Well, all right, let's head for the cave, then. We can grab a few hours rest and then set out for White Horse. Get up! Get up! The following morning at dawn, Sergeant Preston set out with King and headed for the other side of the gorge. When he reached the approximate place across from which he had been shot, he found hoof marks and followed them. Hold on, you. Hold on. Steady, fellow. Here's where they waited in the bushes on the edge of the gorge. All right, King. Find them, fella. Half them. Steady, Blackie. Easy. Get up there. Sergeant Preston and King had no difficulty following the trail, which at first headed in the direction of Selkirk to the north, then circled and headed southeast in the direction of the foothills. Finally, after riding for over an hour, they came to the creek where once again Alex and Joe had ridden along in the shallow water. Oh, there. Oh, Blackie. Find them, King. Find them. The intelligent dog paused at the water's edge and sniffed the air. His keen sense of smell caught the scent of the men, which still clung to the foliage along the creek bank. Which way they go, fella? Find them. For a moment longer, King stood as if undecided. Then, with a triumphant bark, he set out along the creek bank toward the south. Good boy, King. Get up there, Blackie. Dawn found Alex and Joe busy loading the furs onto their pack horses in preparation for the trip to Whitehorse. They had slept a few hours inside the cave and now felt no big need to rush matters since they were certain Sergeant Preston was dead and that King would not be of use to anyone else. Though they were inside the small cave with the pack horses, they had left their saddle horses waiting outside the entrance, tethered to a tree. As he started to lift another bundle of furs, Joe paused a moment, listening. Hey, Alex, you hear that? Hear what? Now get busy loading the furs. Oh, no, wait a minute. I think I heard a, bo- a dog barking. Oh, I didn't hear anything. Anyway, it might have been a timber wolf you heard if you did hear anything. Well, what about it? I keep thinking of that dog of Preston. Ah, don't be a fool. You think that dog's got brains enough to come trailing us by himself? No, but anyway... I'll it... go out and look and see if anyone's coming just to satisfy you. You see anyone? No, nobody in sight. You must be hearing things. Now, let's get these furs loaded, and then we can get started. Nobody's going to catch up with us now that Preston's out of the way. Now, come on, get busy. Sergeant Preston and King had left the creek and were following the branch trail and ran near the cave. As they rounded a bend in the trail, Preston caught sight of the two horses tethered to the tree in front of the cave. Oh, cave and two horses at the entrance. Quiet, King. Quiet, fella. Easy, boy. Come on, King. Do the scully quick. Come on, Blackie. Get around there. Oh, Blackie. Oh, Blackie. We'll wait here a few minutes. Steady now, bro. Yes, I know, boy. You want to go on after them. But if they heard you bark, they'll come out to have a look. We'll leave Blackie here and circle around so as to come up alongside that cave entrance. All right, King. Let's go, boy. It took quite a little while for Preston and King to reach the cliff wall and approach the entrance to the cave. But finally, they reached the tethered horses without being observed from inside. Quickly, Preston untied the horses and gave each a hard slap. Get going there. Get up! As the horses galloped away down the slope, Preston took King by the collar and pulled the dog against the wall just outside the entrance. Meantime, inside the cave, the two crooks finished loading the pack horses. There. I guess they'll carry all right now, Joe. Yeah. Now that we're ready, we better not waste any more time getting started. Took longer than I expected to load those furs. Hey, what was that? The horse was outside. They're running away. They got loose. Come on, quick. As the two crooks ran from the cave, Sergeant Preston moved in between them so that he stood between the cave entrance and them. Then he called out. Reach, both of you, and don't turn around. Come on, it's Preston, but it can't be. Oh, it can't be. Preston's dead. At Preston's command, both men had stopped and, raising their hands, had looked back over their shoulders. The look of surprise on Alex's face gave way to one of cunning, and with a sudden movement, he twisted sideways, dropping to one knee and grabbing his gun. No, you don't. As he spoke, Joe jumped behind the tree where the horses had been tethered, at the same time turning with his gun in his hand. But even as he raised his gun, King, whom he hadn't noticed, sprang from the side with a deep-throated growl. 
the great dog moved like a streak of lightning and grabbing Joe's gun arm, bore him to the ground. Sun King, down. I'll take that gun. Now get up, you. Keep that dog back. He won't hurt you unless you ask for it. But you've got something to settle with me right now. What do you mean by that? You and your partner both deserve a beating for trying to kill me from ambush last night. Since he's wounded, he can't fight. But you can. You wouldn't talk that way if you didn't have a gun in that dog with you. Well, holster my gun there. Go lie down, King. Lie down, boy. All right, you. Why, I'll push your face in, Mountie. That's what I was waiting for. Take this. I'll get you for that. Tough, huh? No. And here's one for Gary Evans. No. And this is for King and for me. No, 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 no. no. I can't fight. I gotta give up. All right, King. Watch both of them while I tie them up. And we'll round up their horses and get them back to Selkirk. You two are under arrest in the name of the Queen. Later that day, Gary and Lucy Evans arrived at the constable's office, where Sergeant Preston and King were waiting with the constable. We got your message about catching the Furthies, Sergeant. Gary insisted upon coming to town in spite of his wounded arm. We can't thank you and King enough for getting our furs back, Sergeant. I knew if Sergeant Preston and King got on their trail, they wouldn't have a chance. Well, I'm glad we did get back your furs, Gary. But remember, King and I had a personal reason for catching those two cooks. <laughs> I guess they did make a mistake trying to ambush you and King like they did. There's a narrow escape for both of us at that. Those men are killers. It's a relief to have them behind bars. Both King and I are glad this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Wednesday's adventure. Say, when you watch hard-riding, hard-fighting Hollywood stars in action, remember this. One after another tells you to eat nourishing breakfasts of delicious Quaker-puffed wheat or Quaker-puffed rice topped with milk or cream and fruit. Wheat or rice shot from guns furnishes extra health values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Remember, it's never sold in bags or bulk. Buy Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice tomorrow in the big red and blue Quaker package. Listen Wednesday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the sourdough's dog. When two shady characters known as Scar and Baldy made a frantic attempt to buy Joe Sanford's dog, I suspected that the dog must be worth more than Joe realized. It turned out that this dog was worth $100,000. But before I found out why, Joe was shot from ambush, and King and I had a terrifying brush with death on a collapsing bridge. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Wednesday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fled Friday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns. Your best bet for hot breakfast is Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, if you want to be a star in sports and school activities, make your hot cereal Quaker Oats, because Quaker Oats helps grow the stars of the future. You get more growth more endurance from oatmeal than from any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker...